Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, welcome to Weaponizing Data Science for Social Engineering, Automated E2E Spearfishing on Twitter. Uh, we are in the South Seas ABE room with John Seymour and Philip Tully. Uh, now before we begin, a few brief notes. The Black Hat Arsenal is on the Palm Foyer on level three, and of course the Arsenal reception is at five. Stop by the Business Hall located in Bayside AB. If you haven't picked up your merchandise, today is your last chance to visit Black Hat Swag and Bookstore and visit the Cali Linux Lab in Mandalay Bay A. Uh, thanks for putting your phone on vibrate. It makes it easier for the rest of us to ignore the ringing while you wait for your voicemail to pick up. And here we go. All right. Thanks for that introduction. Every year, Black Hat asks its attendees what are their greatest concerns. And every year, phishing, social network exploits, or other forms of social engineering is near the top of the list. Traditionally, there are two types of phishing campaigns standard phishing, which is usually automated but has a very low success rate, and spear phishing, which has a much higher success rate but with much higher cost. The social media pen testing tool we demonstrate and release today combines the automation of phishing with the effectiveness of spear phishing. And with that, we'd like to introduce. Uh, Thank you for coming to our talk called uh, Weaponizing Data Science for Social Engineering, Automated End-to-End -end Spear Phishing on Twitter. My name is John Seymour. My hacker handle is Delta Zero, and I'm a data scientist at Zero Fox. Uh, during the night, I'm a PhD student at University of Maryland, Baltimore County, and in my free time, I like to re research malware data sets. Okay, and my name is Philip Telly. I'm a senior si uh, data scientist at Xerofox. Um, so Xerofox is the social media security company. Um, it detects, prevents, and takes down threats emanating from social media. In a past life, I did a PhD at the University of Edinburgh and the Royal Institute of Technology in Stockholm, Sweden. Um, and my research focus there was more on brain modeling and, and artificial neural networks. So I was trying to figure out how the brain stores and recalls memories in the form of patterns of spikes uh, that were emanating from these individual neurons. Very like biologically detailed models. Um, now, uh, I think this technique transitions well into the field of social media. Um, instead of finding patterns within spikes, I'm dealing more with finding patterns and generating um, text, right? So this is called natural language processing. Um, NLP enables humans to derive meaning um, sorry, enables computers to derive meaning from um, human, natural, human or natural language input. Um, and this is, this is not something new. This field has been around for over 50 years. Uh, one of the classic examples of NLP um, happened in 1966. This was the ELISA chatbot. It was developed by a psychotherapist named Joseph Weizenbaum. And it was done in a clinical setting to try to um, give some feedback and back and forth to patients who were either close to dead or on their deathbeds. Um, so for, an, for example, it would be very kind of naive parsing and keyword replacement. It would do something like um, if the patient would say, my head hurts, the chatbot would respond, um, why do you say your head hurts? So it would just be this very kind of uh, naive way to interact with the patient. Um, although it was naive, it did manage to pass the Turing test to some extent or part of this kind of um, complicated Turing test where you have a human and a computer behind a closed wall and you're trying to figure out um, or trying to guess whether or not that is actually artificial or not. Um, in 50 years, the progress has been made though, much progress has been made, and I want to give an example of just recently, uh, Microsoft's released Tay and You, an AI chatbot on Twitter. Uh, and this is interesting, um, it was kind of an, a neural network that learned dynamically how to uh, tweet based on people tweeting at it, right? So every tweet that it received, it learned from that tweet and tried to spit back a tweet in response. Um, it sounded like a good idea at the time, but it ended up to be semi-disastrous because um, Twitter is a sewer, <laughs> as it were, um, of content. So the, the bot ended up being this uh, you know, race-baiting, fear-mongering, uh, sexually explicit, uh, terrible Nazi bot. Um, and so they suffered some PR disaster from this. Um, anyway, I'd like to make the point that um, InfoSec in machine learning has traditionally emphasized defense, right? Um, the adversary or the bad actor comes um, and tries to penetrate some system or some network. 
Um, and it's the job of the vendors downstairs in the booths and the products to try to provide defense or try to remediate these um, offensive attacks. So um, it's very reactive in a sense. And you can see this throughout um, the last 10 or 15 years at Black Hat, there's been a, a slew of amazing talks how to you know, do spam filtering in email, um, talks ranging from botnet identification to network defense to intrusion detection. Um, and we think that we can take lessons from these defensive things and apply it in an offensive manner. So data is not only useful to, uh, to the defensive um, infosec worker, but also on the offensive side, right? So with that, we want to talk today about Snapper. Um, it's an acronym for the Social Network Automated Phishing with Reconnaissance tool. Um, the tool is split up into two phases. In the first phase, um, it takes as input a list of Twitter users, and we'll go more into this later. Um, but it, it extracts a subset of these users uh, based on how it defines high value users. So it prioritizes those users to be targeted. In the second phase of this pipeline, um, it takes the individual posts from each of these users' timelines and crafts a tweet at these users uh, prepended with their at mention uh, username and um, ending with a shortened link. Uh, and we collect metrics on how often this link is clicked across many different users. Um, and we're going to go into more details now, but I want to mention we, we're going to do a live demo. And uh, demo, God's willing, it hopefully goes well, but we want you guys in the audience to tweet to this hashtag if you want to volunteer to be spearfished. We're not going to actually send you malicious content in this spear phishing message. Um, but if you tweet to it, we're going to extract some information from your timeline and craft a tweet at you based on the interests of your timeline. And you can weigh whether or not it is something that you might end up clicking later on or not. Um, so the trajectory of the talk is going to be, John's going to talk about machine learning and offense, and we're going to go into each of these different phases of the tool, target discovery and social spear phishing. We're going to go into detail about how to generate these tweets, and then we're going to wrap up with some evaluation results and comparing to other similar techniques in the literature. All right, cool. So um, one of the first questions is why is social media and Twitter specifically a you know, good venue for doing spear phishing, um, and especially autonomously? Um, so there's actually quite a few reasons why social networks are different than and, you know, the standard emails or, or things like that that you might think of. Um, the first being there's a very, very good API for scraping data off of Twitter. Um, so anything you post on Twitter, people can collect all of the hashtags you use, all the posts, you know, all the statuses, what time they happen, those sorts of things, very, very easily. And this is actually generalized across most of the social networks out there. Um, there's also a very, very colloquial syntax on Twitter. I don't know if you've noticed. Um, perfect grammar isn't really the norm. And so machine learning models that are imperfect can still actually act on par with normal users, which is actually pretty cool. There's also uh, this idea, like Twitter in specific, has this character limit. Um, so every single link on Twitter is shortened. And this, you know, extends to other social networks too. Most, uh, most links on, you know, these social networks are shortened. And so it, it helps with obfuscating payloads. So if, if you want to, you know, send something to someone and don't want them to know where the link goes to, it's very easy to do. Next, there's this sort of trusting culture, right? Um, email, everybody knows what, like, the Prince of Nigeria is, I hope. Like, nobody's going to respond to that. But nobody really suspects, you know, social networks as harboring malicious, you know, intent, right? If somebody tweets at me saying, hey, check out this link, I'm going to be like, cool, and I'm going to assume it's, you know, associated my interests. And that's actually one of the things that we're trying to bring attention to today and with releasing this tool. And finally, there's this idea of incentivized data disclosure, right? So basically when you get on Twitter or Reddit or whatever, you want people to like and share your posts. Um, you want to get upvotes, you know, karma, whatever. And that's actually something that's really interesting because it makes people want to share personal de uh, details about themselves, right? And so um, it, it's, it, it ends up being like a, a prime venue for testing out these sorts of things. And before we really get into it, um, there was a really cool talk at ShmooCon called Honeyfish, and uh, we just wanted to give a really quick shout out to them because they were a huge inspiration for this project. But uh, getting into the nitty gritty of what Snapper does, um, first off, as Phil was saying earlier, um, it pre tweets with an app mention, right? 
And so for Twitter in particular, if you have a tweet with an at mention at the beginning of it, it actually treats the tweet differently than all other tweets. It calls it a reply. And so that means only followers who follow both you and the person mentioned in the at mention can see the tweet. And since we're making, you know, our own bots here, uh, if we don't have any followers, that means only the target can see the tweet. And so we know if the link that was clicked was, uh, if we know the link was clicked, we know it was that target who clicked the link, which is actually kind of cool. And on that same vein, uh, our tool in the box shortens the payload uniquely for each user. So um, that means that we can check and say, hey, this particular target, we sent this particular link and they clicked it or they did not click it. And that actually ends up being a pretty huge strength. Um, as Phil was also saying earlier, uh, we treat as users with uh, respect to value and engagement. So one thing is if you just get on Twitter and start spamming links over and over again, generally you'll, you know, get banned. Um, the thing here is we actually uh, save API requests and save, um, sa like sort of hide a little bit better if we only target people who are likely to click on the links, right? And so we have a machine learning model built in to where um, it actively uh, triages these users into those and only targets those users. And then finally, in the box, our tool obeys rate limits. Now, of course, you know, bad people can get around these, right? Um, but this, you know, makes sure that Twitter doesn't, you know, get upset or anything like that. Um, a few things that aren't in the box that you probably want to do if you use this tool. Um, we, uh, if you only post links, Twitter's actually pretty good at finding that and, you know, um, banning you. So you, you have to mix in some, like, normal content in as well. So some non-phishing posts, some links, uh, some posts without links in them, some posts without, you know, particular app mentions. And uh, another thing is you have to build like a believable profile, otherwise no one's gonna click your links as well. Um, if you just have like, you know, standard first thing you create is an egg profile, um, if you just have that, like nobody's gonna click on you. So uh, those are two things that don't actually get wrapped up into our box, but you need to add as well. So at a very, very high level, how the tool works, first it goes through, you give it a list of Twitter users and a payload, and it calls basically for each user, it calls a machine learning model um, to find out if they're a target. And assuming they are, then it goes and collects their timeline to a specified depth and uh, generates a tweet either using a Markov model or a neural network. After you, you get the tweet, you can also say whether or not you want it to schedule the tweet for some time that the user's very active, or you can just go ahead and post the tweet in case you're doing something like a live demo on stage. And with that. So with that, we'll go into the first phase of this tool, um, automated target discovery. So we're going to use clustering um, to try to prioritize targets out of a given list of input users. Um, so first of all, uh, here's an example of a Twitter profile for those of you who aren't familiar with it. Um, as John mentioned before, you have a ton of accessible personal information listed there not only in the description part of the, twi uh, of the profile up in the left corner be below the name of this, this is Eric Schmidt, the former CEO of Google, um, but you also have a ton of personal information listed in the tweet history of this person, um, historical profile posts, and you have not only text-based information, uh, but you have heterogeneous information like integers, like the number of followers and the number of following. Uh, you have dates, like when the account was created. Uh, and you have a ton of different um, kind of Boolean uh, or, or binary yes or no uh, fields in the tweet indicating uh, whether or not they've changed their default profile settings from when they first started the pro um, when they first signed up for Twitter. Uh, so this is what that profile looks like when you make a Twitter API call. Um, so you get um, a JSON formatted response like this. Um, and we use this information at scale to extract features and to cluster these users or group them together um, according to these features. Uh, so the first thing we look at is the content of the description um, and why that, why that may be useful. For example, for Eric Schmidt, if you list something like a job title, like you're a CEO, CTO, CISO, C star O, um, or a recruiter, somebody that might have access on, on your network to some more sensitive information, um, this is a, usually the tool selects this as a, as a solid indicator that that person should be prioritized in the target list. Um, next is the level of engagement. 
the tool tries to select people or users who have a high engagement in Twitter, so they have a lot of followers or following, people following them. Um, the account age or hashtag my first tweet, how long has the account been active for? It's just measuring again kind of engagement, how active is the user on the, um, on the network? And it measures some of these default settings, uh, like has the profile background image or has the image, is it still an egg profile? Have those fields ever changed or um, are they still what they were when you first created the account? Um, so to give an example here, again with Eric Schmidt, if you can take all those different kind of, um, all those different features and all those kind of fields from the raw Twitter API call uh, and featureize them and project that into a 2D, um, a 2D map here, you have one Twitter user expressed as a point on this 2D plane. And so one Twitter user, Eric Schmidt, expressed um, on a plane of many, many other Twitter users. Um, so this is, this is kind of how we apply clustering. Um, you, can, you can imagine that Eric Schmidt might belong to the cluster of users that we want to target, right? So the ones, the users that belong to the red target are the ones that we select as, um, as targets and the ones who belong to the green or the blue ones we kind of push aside. Um, and this is optional in the tool. You can choose to do this or not depending on how, how much you want to scale this kind of uh, activity up. Um, so clustering kind of below the surface here, um, you have many different kinds of clustering algorithms that you can use to do this and each of those algorithms have um, a certain number of associated hyperparameters. So parameters associated with each of those uh, clustering algorithms like k-means, db-scan, et cetera. Um, how we end up selecting them, the true model um, that we end up deploying, uh, we, we choose it based on the maximum average silhouette score. Um, so the silhouette score is a measurement that's bounded between negative one and one and it shows how similar a data point is to its own cluster versus, um, versus how different it is compared to data points in other clusters. So it's like this measurement of cohesion versus separation between the clusters. Uh, and we found that for the, um, the, end, the model that we ended up selecting, we have a silhouette score of around 0.65. And so this is um, in the literature thought of as kind of a reasonable structure to select from. Um, and so in this plot here, you have different algorithms and different number of clusters. This is the parameter we're tuning here, one, two, or three. Uh, and they're labeled starting at, uh, they're zero based. And so each data point has a, has a silhouette score associated with it. Um, and so the way that we select it is this average. So the, the dotted red line averages across all of these different silhouette scores and that's the average silhouette score. And that's basically the line that's furthest to the right in this plot. Um, that's the algorithm and the hyperparameter that we're gonna select. All right, so uh, before we get into actually generating the text, let's talk about maybe some of the boilerplate around the tweets. Um, the first problem we ran into is we want to choose like a URL shortener to, you know, hide a payload or something like that, right? And uh, we, we found this malicious link. Uh, it's malicious and phishing. You know, several records on Viostotal say it is. Um, we checked it out, it is. And uh, we looked through a lot of different URL shorteners and uh, we found goo.gl lets us shorten it and several others. And as a side note, um, it looks like actually this is being used, you know, in the wild or pen testing or something because it's when we actually shortened it was at the far right and people are clicking on this shortened link well before we actually, uh, we shortened it ourselves, right? Um, but another thing is like we, we went through and goo.gl also gives us analytics which is really, really cool. It tells us, you know, what refers actually clicked on the link, you know, uh, what countries they're from, um, the different browsers, for example, like, you know, Chrome, Safari, whatever, and even the platforms. So, like, we can tell if somebody clicked on using an iPhone versus Android versus, you know, some, uh, like, Windows or something like that. So, these are all desirable properties of a URL shortener, right? Um, for example, another thing is goo.gl looks legitimate, right? People, you know, see a goo.gl link on their timeline, they're not going to be, oh, hey, you know, that looks a little fishy, right? Um, it's from Google, it's probably safe, right? But uh, we, we just demonstrated that goo.gl can link to malicious sites. So uh, that's definitely something that we want in our tool, right? Um, again, it also, you know, gives us really cool analytics, but uh, it, it has a lot of APIs that we can, you know, use to both obtain these analytics programmatically and create short and unique payloads on the fly. So uh, this is why we actually ended up choosing goo.gl. 
Um, but note, like, we, we definitely want to emphasize we never actually posted malicious links on anyone's profile. Um, we only used things like google.com as our, you know, spear phishing payloads um, in, in our tests. So uh, please don't get mad at us for that. Um, another thing that, uh, that we do, uh, we do some minor recon and profiling, uh, recon and footprinting for profiling. Um, so two major things that we do. Uh, first, we want to figure out a good time to actually post the tweet, right? And so if we, you know, are running our tool at 12 in the morning and the user is in a di different time zone and like, you know, it's 7 o'clock, you know, at night and they're not online or whatever, uh, we don't want to post the tweet then because it's not likely that they'll see it, right? Um, so through Twitter's API what we do is we grab all of their recent tweets and we generate, you know, a histogram of what their, you know, tweet time frequencies are, right? And so this is actually my, uh, my own personal profile on the left. So apparently I like to uh, post a lot at 11 p.m. Uh, take that what you will. But um, so, so we can actually schedule the post and we, we do so by selecting a random minute within the most frequent hour that they actually post themselves. Um, another thing that we do is we look at the topics that they like to post about. And actually first we were, we were doing some really like complicated, you know, topic modeling type stuff. Um, but then we found actually just a simple bag of words on their timeline tweets works really freaking well. Um, so we, we use that and we just seed the model with a random topic that the user frequently posts about. Cool. Um, so to proceed here, now we want to get to the nitty gritty aspect of this tool, how to generate a tailored tweet towards a specific user. So again, to, re to reiterate, we've we've gone through and we we've, we've selected a subset of users, and we've we've calculated um, when they like to post the tweet and what they like to talk about. Now we want to generate a tweet towards them. Um, so to do this, we we leverage two um, two separate different architectures. One is a Markov model, and this has been popular in terms of text generation um, for a subreddit simulator, InfoSec Titlebot. Um, the idea is basically that given a corpus, and a corpus here is defined as um, a history of tweets, maybe the last 200 tweets, last 500 tweets, last 1,000 tweets, however much data you want to grab, um, reads through those tweets and calculates pairwise frequencies between the words that are contained within those tweets, right? Um, so for example here, um, you have the word I and you have the word don't, um, and that might, that might in the corpus give you a 0.38 probability of transition. Um, and you also have the word like and you have kind of this normalization here so you have a 0.62 of transition in there so then when you go back to then generate a tweet based on this history, um, it's going to look like, uh, you know, Twitterese or something that one might expect from, uh, from someone posting in English um, and it's going to, it's going to resemble kind of the topics that they've liked to talk about historically. Um, again, this is like a state based um, Markov model and it's based on transition probabilities. Uh, we tested out a different model, which is a bit different, and this is a LSTM recurrent neural network. LSTM stands for long short term memory. Um, this is a bit more cumbersome. We had to use an Amazon EC2 instance, uh, and we had to go out and grab two million tweets to pre-train the model with. Um, to grab these tweets, we didn't go out and just randomly sample from Twitter, because like I said, Twitter is a sewer, so you're going to get a lot of weird stuff, right? So Twitter actually has an account called at verified. Uh, and this is basically all of the officially verified Twitter accounts, um, or it follows all of the officially verified Twitter accounts currently on that platform. And so the idea being that if your account is verified, you're likely not some automated bot or some kind of weirdo. You, you actually might have like some public, public image or you've been pre-selected by Twitter uh, to be like a representative user. Um, so it took five and a half days to train this. Uh, and we used three layers of this neural network and we had about 500 units per layer. And the idea of the LSTM as opposed to the Markov model, like I said, the Markov model only computes transition probabilities on a word by word basis. So it only looks at the word that the, that the current word is adjacent to. What the LSTM model is much better at is um, it gets around this problem of long term dependencies between words inside a tweet, right? So, you might have a word that occurs later on in the sentence that is somehow related to a word that occurs at the beginning of the sentence, it provides context for it. Um, 
recurrent neural networks like LSTM are really, really good at solving this problem because they have this gated type architecture which allows information to be saved off um, or kind of passed on on a dynamic basis. Um, there are some trade offs and caveats to these two approaches. Um, first off, uh, the training speed for the LSTM, as I mentioned, takes a while. It takes a few days and it takes a decent amount of computing architecture. Um, for the Markov chain, uh, opposedly, it only takes a matter of milliseconds. You can dynamically take the Markov chain, point it at someone's last thousand tweets, and there you have kind of like a naive model of what they like to talk about. Um, we didn't see much difference. We didn't see a significant difference in the accuracy between these. And accuracy, by that I mean um, the click through rates. So we scaled this up and targeted a lot of users and then measured how often a user clicked through to the appended link versus, versus when they didn't. Um, the availability, availability of both of these different tools are, are public. There's public tools both to uh, train up an LSTM and a Markov model. Um, and the relative size of these um, on disk, the LSTM is much bigger. The, the advantage of the LSTM generally is you get kind of a deeper representation of what it means to be posting on Twitter, what, like a Twitterese, like we like to call it. Um, it's not quite English or it's not quite whatever language have you. It's kind of this abbreviated syntax laden, um, different punctuation, emojis, URLs, everything you want thrown in there, broken, broken language. Um, and so we seed the neural network with that, with the topic that John talked about before, and it generates something that um, looks fairly, uh, fairly legible. Um, then for the Markov chain, what you can end up having, because you look at only a subset of the tweets from their history, you can end up overfitting to that user somehow. And by that I mean if someone is talking about temporally relevant information um, on one hand, like the Olympics in July uh, or, or August, uh, and then you go ahead and point this model at them in October or November, that might be kind of an event that happened in the past and no longer relevant and that might raise suspicion that you're being targeted by a bot, as it were. Um, right. So one of the cool things though we like to point out about Markov models um, is that because they're based on the content of each individual user, it's kind of more dynamically deployed. Uh, you can actually, out of the box, get a tool that is language agnostic. Right? So you don't have to be uh, having your tweets in English, it can be in Spanish, it can be in um, different character sets like Russian, Chinese, or Arabic even. Um, like I said, the Markov chain just simply calculates transition probabilities between these words. Um, so you can generate, uh, so, so I've been told, fairly legible tweets in different languages uh, using, using this tool. And for the neural net, oppositely, you would have to go out like I did and grab tweets from verified users in English mostly. Uh, and do that same kind of process if you want to target different languages in advance. Um, and kind of the take home point here, we don't want to necessarily harp on the fact that Twitter is susceptible to this. This, this, can, this approach can be applied on any, any social network um, and we would argue even more, even more broadly, um, any kind of online communication service where people are interacting with each other. It raises this issue, you know, of like how do you know you're talking to a bot or if you're not. Um, and with that, I'll pass it on to yeah, cool. John. Awesome. Um, so before I start the evaluation results and demo section, I just want to remind you guys we are releasing the tool. It's on the Black Hat CD, DEF CON CD, and we'll have a GitHub repo up shortly. Um, but you can verify all this yourself. Um, so, so we started off with some wild testing of Snapper, um, and it actually did surprisingly well, right? Like, uh, so the bottom is some of the tweets that it was generated, and you can see it's talking about like, we, we started scraping, you know, hashtag infosec, hashtag Pokemon Go, things like that, and you can actually see things like it's talking about Woody Allen, and um, like seventh tweet down is talking about Pokemon Go and things like that. So, uh, so it's actually generating some pretty good tweets. Um, and even when we posted some of them, um, people were, you know, responded saying, you know, thanks but links broken, right? So this, this proves, this is very good proof of concept, right? So we did a pilot experiment. Um, we, uh, we basically used Snapper, we pushed a button saying Snapper go on uh, 90 different people using hashtag cat, because cats are cool on the internet and whatnot. Um, and uh, we were actually really, really surprised. Even in this first like prototypical pilot experiment, after two hours we had a 17% click-through rate. And uh, if we let the link saturate a bit, 
um, after two days we had a, a 30 percent to 66 percent uh, click through rate. And the reason for this sort of huge range is because actually there are a lot of bots that crawl through Twitter and click links randomly. Um, so, so that was really interesting to me. If we use the actual like strictest definition of you know what a user might be, so making sure like the refer is actually t.co and making sure like the location matches up with their profile and things like that, um, we, we get a 30 percent click through rate for that pilot experiment. Um, if, if we use a little bit less strict uh, requirements for verifying whether someone's a, a clicking a link as a person versus a bot, um, like for example not you know making sure the location matches up, um, we actually got a 66 percent click through rate there. Um, we're trying to avoid being fuddy so we're giving the 30 percent as like our actual rate of success here. Um, so then uh, later we were, we were actually trying to sort of stress test the tool and see um, whether or not the, the tool itself was actually better than a human at fishing people, right? And so we actually had a bake off. We had a person uh, generate phishing tweets um, and the strategy he used was he copied and pasted messages to different hashtags. Um, he was able to in two hours target 129 people which comes out to 1.075 tweets per minute and he got 49 click throughs. With one instance of Snapper, we were able to target in that same two hours 819 people which comes out to around uh, 6.85 tweets per minute and we got a total of 275 click throughs. And furthermore, with Snapper, you can actually arbitrarily scale it to the number of machines you have. So um, the fact that just one instance was able to outperform them um, is actually pretty freaking cool. So as sort of a summary um, and with some actual stats, um, phishing generally speaking is already mostly automated, right? Uh, you can click a button just like our tool and you get really, really low success rates. So you get between 5 and 14 percent accuracy is what we've seen the best uh, phishing campaigns have. Um, on the other hand, spear phishing, which is highly manual, takes around like 10 minutes to actually create a single post because you have to research the target, you know, figure out what they like, figure out what time, you know, that sort of thing. Um, it's super highly manual and you only still get around 40 to 45 percent uh, accuracy in the best spear phishing campaigns. And in our multiple tests, we found that Snapper actually is fully automated. We just click a button and it runs and it gets between 30 and 35 percent of people clicking through the link, which is actually pretty high. And so with that, we'll actually go ahead and pray to the demo gods and hope that it actually works. Cool. To see, okay, so we got about uh, 51 people who tweeted out the hashtag. All right, so this is actually the command to use it. And of course I'm not in my virtual environment. Yeah. Cool. So what this is going is it's actually going down and retrieving the person's timeline and creating a, a this is the actual tweet, this is my actual personal, you know, account here, right? Because we want to make sure we have something that works. Um, and so Twitter's API sample for the most recent scan and here's the unique Google link for me. And so we can actually go over, here's a, here's our little, you know, bot guy who's uh, tweeting and do, 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 hopefully, yeah, there we go. So um, it automatically tweeted to me, you know, that actual post. And notice first off that uh, it's not going to show up on my tweets or tweets and replies. Where it's actually going to show up is in my notifications because it's a reply like we talked about earlier. And here it is. So like I'm the only person who can actually see this tweet. And uh, I can blow that up a bit. But uh, yeah. So it goes through, that was completely autonomous, right? I was standing here making a talk, not writing a post. And it's actually scrolling through you guys and uh, send you guys different posts and here's some of the ones it's generated so far. So yeah, pretty cool. Oops, yeah. 
that going to go away? Oh, yeah, sorry about that. Let's do that. Um, yeah, so then just a few slides to wrap up. Um, so, so why did we do this? Um, we did this for awareness and education. We, um, we, we want to make sure that people are aware um, of, the, of the danger or the susceptibility of Twitter and social media in general to phishing attacks and spear phishing attacks. Like John said before, we think that email is a, is a methodology that people are more, more in tune to. They get training. Um, it's, it's kind of a well, uh, well adapted system there. But, but in terms of social media, people are a lot more flamboyant and careless, I, we, we think, when it comes to clicking on links. You could also use this tool to automate internal pen testing. You can imagine if you have all the Twitter usernames of your company or your organization or whatever it may be, um, you run this tool on that subset of people. Uh, you, you can gather statistics on you know, how likely those people are to be targeted um, and actually follow through and, be, and click through these links. Um, you might also use this for kind of non-infosec related things like advertising or staff recruiting. Uh, it allows you to, because it allows you to go out and, and gather data and tailor messages towards people, this might be very useful in those contexts. Um, again, emphasizing we're, we're white hats here. Uh, machine learning though is something that we think you're not going to have to have a PhD soon in order to be able to, to talk about it or do this kind of thing. Uh, it's going to become a lot more layman and it's going to be spread a lot more and become a lot more normal in people's products and the way that people talk about these kind of solutions. Um, so we just want to raise awareness about this issue and that it can be used offensively in general. Um, a way to get around this is to protect your account. Um, so you can go that and you can check, you can change your Twitter not notifications and this will make it impossible for someone to automate scraping of your timeline. Um, another mitigation might be that bots can be detected. Um, there's been some defensive machine learning talks already at Black Hat this year and in the past. Uh, bot detection is, a, is kind of a well-known technique, especially on Twitter. People have written machine learning models like classifiers that can tell whether or not based on certain features like how, how often or how regularly um, accounts are posting um, and use these to determine what, if, if that account is a bot or not. Um, and again, standard mitigations reply, uh, apply. So if you think that you're being targeted, report the post, report the tweeter. Um, Twitter is usually pretty good about following up on this um, and at flagging spam accounts. So to summarize here, um, ML can be used offensively to automate spear phishing and Twitter is a good venue to, to use this because their users, um, they have a low bar of permissibility for acceptable messages. You don't have to create the most convincing or compelling tweet to target somebody. Uh, because of broken syntax abbreviations and stuff like this. And, uh, and finally, um, social media is unique in that abundant personal data is available and this can be effectively used to socially engineer somebody. And with that, um, we'll take some questions. I think we have five minutes. And if you guys want to talk to us afterwards, we'll be at the Zero Fox booth at number one, or 1032 after the talk. And we are going to um, release the source code uh, if you have the Black Hat disk already, it should be on there. But um, we're going to publish the GitHub link on our Twitter, um, on our Twitter profile. So look out for that. Uh, and thank you. Yeah, cool. Oh, awesome. um, so if you have a question, maybe just step up to a mic. Hi, thanks guys, I have a question. Um, so does this also work for direct messages for DMs or is it only public tweets? So uh, our tool only does uh, public tweets right now. Um, we figured it, it would be a little easier just to implement and things like that, but we don't see any reason why it wouldn't work for DMs as well. And Philip, when you mentioned uh, the protected tweets, did you mean the completely locked down, only followers can see it, or did you mean something else? Um, yes, exactly. So you can go to your Twitter settings and change your account from kind of a more public setting, which comes as a default, to like a protected, um, a protected um, yeah. setting, and that will that will make it impossible for someone to go out and use the Twitter API to scrape 
data off of your timeline. So yeah, like there are some bad sides with that. Like you actually have to accept followers and things like that. Um, but we'll also emphasize you, you should treat social media like you would treat email. Actually, like look at the link. You know, make sure that the person that tweeted it to you is someone you trust, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but if you're, you know, the really paranoid type type thing, this is an easy way to completely defeat this tool. I uh, saw that there was emojis used in some of the tweets, and I was just wondering how the uh, like the tweets that you all sent back to somebody. How does the does it just treat it as a character, or how does it right. uh, assimilate that into the tweets? Right. This uh, so this depends on how you um, how you pre-process the tweets. So you know you can you can treat each word you can separate on white space, for example, or you can pre-process away things. Like for example, we we pre-processed away and we eliminated specific usernames and specific URLs because we thought that it would be weird to be posting URLs maybe that are built by a neural network so they might be completely random or nonsensical. Right. Same thing with the username. You might get an at mention looking something like a real Twitter username but probably not likely, right? Yeah. Um, but in the case of URLs, uh, sorry, in the case of emojis, like you said, uh, this is something that can be learned and then generated on the fly. Markov text kind of tends to be tend toward getting stuck in loops in my experience. Do you just trust on the character limit to prevent that from happening to you or do you detect that at all? So um, actually for the Markov we use word based first off. So um, and, and because of Twitter's short character limits um, we haven't actually seen it getting stuck in loops very often. Um, if it does we just chalk it up to yeah it was a bad tweet, it's not going to click, right, no machine learning system is perfect. But um, yeah, it still works well even with those sorts of downsides. It's definitely a valid criticism, yeah. Um, and if it gets stuck in a loop, like you said, it's only 140 characters. So if someone repeats a word over and over again, they just might feel really strongly about that word. <laughs> <laughs> cool. Any other questions? Awesome. Thank you guys for. Oh, we get one more. Yep. Oh, no. yep, thanks. All right, cool. Thank you guys for coming. <laughs>